Welcome back to another edition of Info on the Go, the show where I give tips, tricks, and insight on how to buy, sell, or invest in real estate the easy way. If this is your first time to the channel, thanks for watching and grab something to take notes with because today's session is jam-packed with information. I got a chance to sit on a kitchen table roundtable discussion on the home buying process with none other than George Thompson. Now, George is the owner and president of Thompson Wealth Management, Inc. It's a firm which gives people smarter ways to manage their money as well as how to grow it and keep it. He also serves as the pastor of stewardship at Faithful Central Bible Church in Inglewood, California, and is consequently our financial advisor. So you're gonna to wanna to take notes, lots of information as we give you techniques and tips of going through the home buying process, as we discuss what it's like purchasing as an investor, what it's like purchasing as a single person, and what it's like purchasing as a couple. We're also gonna give you insight on how the economy affects your home buying process. So without further ado, this was episode one of George Thompson's Ready, Set, Grow podcast. So here at the table with us, we have Krista. How you doing? I'm good. Good, good, good. We also have Diedrich. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you, sir? Good, good. So we're going to have this. And then also we have a very special song of the day is that everybody, I have my twin sister, Jennifer, with us today. Hi, everybody. Good, good, good. So, hey, we're going to be talking about areas of real estate. And you know what I hear people saying? I want to get a home. And we want to make sure we go through the process and understand the journey and how we're doing. So I'm going to start right off with you, uh, Krista, and everything like this. Right. So you bought a house, right? So can you tell us just a little bit about um, how you became a homeowner, like just the process, of like kind of how you started and then just kind of how you went through? Yeah, I would say that it was a journey. I started in 2017, actually, uh, working with a realtor. And that house process it, it didn't really it didn't really uh, yield into a house right. and so I decided a couple of things I needed to save more money and I also I had to get ready I didn't feel like I was um, really ready to be a homeowner in terms of the amount of funds I needed to have in the bank um, and so I waited I waited and saved and so it ended up being about three years later that I restarted the hunt right so I just want to show you techniques and we're going through so one thing is you had to you had to save up because a lot of people say, I want to I want to do this. So you have to have a savings. Also, you're a business owner. So are there yeah. any hurdles that you had as far as a business owner, as far as qualifying and things like that? Yeah. So as a business owner, this is the thing that I learned in 2017. So uh, when you're not a business owner, you have W-2s. You can prove your income. When you are a business owner, there are proof of income that you have to have. So I needed to I had income. I had proof of it. But the way you document it was different. So by 2020, when I started my home hunt, I just had more documentation. I had more money in the bank. My credit was even better than it was in 2017. And so I just felt more fortified, more confident, and more competitive uh, in, my, in my home hunt when I started. Right. I'm going to go back into it because you chronicled. One of the reasons why I hear is you, you chronicle is also on social media. So all the difficulties. Yeah. But the two things that we learned from you already are is that number one is, it just may not start off that you get a house, but then you come through, yeah. and now you've lived there for how long now? 13 months. So they actually been, okay, about a year. Yeah. Okay. Are you done with everything, or is everything No, ahead? my dad says you're never done. Okay, gotcha, it's all the process. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. And then we got out the blocks. <laughs> you, just, you just got a home. We found out that you had one. You moved in how many weeks ago? About two, actually. Two weeks yeah, ago. So one of the things is I want to ask you about uh, purchasing a home and also being married with children is a little bit different looking for homes and, and the it process is. and everything. Like it that. is. So in, in doing that, how did you prep your whole family or how did you kind of prep family and get your finance in order so you were able to purchase a home? Yeah, so we kind of like Krista, our journey really started several years ago um, before we actually had kids. So we were kind of looking at different homes, different areas of L.A., being a, um, an entrepreneur myself understanding like you have to chronicle that that income differently so we had some challenges where we had to also wait a few years and then we wound up having kids so the process in terms of what we needed and what we wanted wound up differing vastly once we had kids because the priorities shift at that point right. so we're looking for no longer the you know the space where it's like okay we're young and going out and having fun so we need a space for the kids we need a yard we need to make sure that the school district is good we're looking at all those different things so that all shifted once we had kids the mindset shifted in terms of what we needed 
versus what we wanted. So we're going to talk about mindset shift with everybody. So one of the things we do at home, when you buy a home is you have to make sacrifices. I, I remember it was like it was yesterday. I also moved into a home about a year ago, and I'm almost done doing the renovation because, you know, when I buy a property, it's typically in very bad condition, and I fully renovate it. But I also went, and I need a little bit of help from you on this. I actually went to a property. Danette was giving me a hard time about this. And uh, this was a beautiful property. It was in Windsor. It was looked over, overlooked the entire city. Came in there, did everything, had a full breath room, everything, but no yard at all. Mm-mm. And I wanted to have it, but I knew I couldn't with kids. So there's certain sacrifices you have to make mm-hmm. in order to get what you want. So I want our, you know, people that are watching this or listening to say, like, what are some sacrifices you kind of had to make? So first of all, I'm going to come back to you. Yeah. And I also want to hit Jennifer, and then I'm going to go to you. It's like sacrifice you made. But like one of the first things I think you're going to allude to is they're going out to eat all the time and, and the amount of money you need to save and different things. But what are some sacrifices that you had to make yeah. you know, for you to be a homeowner? Yeah, I think I could name two. Okay. The first is the the budget that I thought my home was going to be. So when I first started looking, this was December 2020, I said, okay, I'm looking for a townhouse and this is my budget. I ended up in a single family home that was 180000 more than what I thought I was going to pay. Right. That was a big number. Right. But what I had to think about it, that's 180 roughly amortized over 30 years. So monthly it wasn't that much, but again, with mindset, when I saw that number, almost $200,000, I thought, I can't afford that. That's such a huge number. That's way more than I thought I was gonna get into buying a home. But actually I could afford it. I was was approved for well over what I actually purchased my home for. So that was one kind of sacrifice and mindset. And then the other one was location. Right. I loved the neighborhood I was living in, Yes. And um, I was trying to buy around that area, generally, but I knew I couldn't really afford it. And I don't mean mindset. I mean, literally, I didn't have an extra $1.4 million to get right. into that neighborhood. Yeah, but where, where you rent, more than likely. <laughs> exactly, where, exactly. So everybody, if you're, you know, if you're watching this, you're not in Los Angeles, you, it's very hard to, re- to live where you're renting yeah. because you're renting. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, exactly. That area. Yeah. So what I did was, and luckily my background's urban planning, so I, I just know LA County, a map in neighborhoods in my brain. So it just meant as I was hunting, I continuously looked further south and more east than I was looking for right. initially. So my map kept expanding. Right. And so I think, you know, that's one of the sacrifices. I knew what I wanted. Right. And so it just meant you had to be flexible. You know, at first I was like, okay, definitely I'm looking at Inglewood. Then I was like, okay, Inglewood adjacent. Or maybe that means Hawthorne, Lawndale. Okay, I was outbid on like seven properties. So I was right. like, okay, well, maybe I'm gonna go further east and south. And then what I, where I ended up was a neighborhood where I actually had worked for three and a half years on the actual street. Wow. So it was it was really meant to be where I ended up. I knew the neighbors and I knew the neighborhood. But I think I only found that home that was meant for me because I gave up the restrictive idea about where I had to be. Right. I had to relax the map. Right. And so this is a couple of things you learned from her. First of all, you leverage your knowledge. You said you worked in urban play. Like sometimes if you're a school teacher, if you, whatever area you work in, try to leverage the knowledge that yeah. you have there. Second is, is that you had to change your, you know, we have to change our mindset when you become a, in, in a real estate. You didn't spend $180,000 more. You invested yes. $180,000 yeah. more. A condo is very nice. I own condos and I own single family homes. A single family home will appreciate in value more than a condo will. So that's how you learn that. So it's more of an investment. So she's going to, and then she's going to, then you're using all them financial terms. She's going to amortize it out over a 30 year period. I feel better about it. I'm like, okay. But at the end of the day, she invested it. So then we're going to reap. So you plant and then you reap. And then she's also in the community doing that. And she's making that neighborhood better. Wow. All right, I'm doing that. <laughs> so next we're going to go over sacrifices. Uh, Dietrich, what do you think? Then Jen, any sacrifices you made when you purchased a home? Dietrich? Uh, I think I'm kind of like Chris. So the sacrifice originally was we um, we were looking in Inglewood because we were staying in La Tierra Village at the time. So we wanted to stay within the area. Um, during that time, our pre-approval would have kept us in the area, but then the Fed did something crazy, and they raised the Fed funds the rate. The Federal Reserve <laughs> raised the interest rates in the United States yeah, of America? So, so normally, that doesn't really have a direct correlation with mortgage rates, but the trickle down from the economy being so uncertain caused lenders to bake in an increase in interest rates. So our rate at the time 
would have been somewhere around 4, 4.15. By the time it was all said and done, APR-wise, it was like 5.875. Mm. Right. And so that pushed our purchasing power obviously down. So we started looking in outer communities. And we were sitting on a Zoom call one day. We were actually thinking about like Carson, Gardena, Compton, sitting on a Zoom call one day. And lo and behold, Danette says something about, think about the city of Compton. And then you came and said, hey, Dietrich, remember, skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it's been. And so we started looking at Compton and driving around, looking at different developments. We found a nice property out there. And at first it was kind of like, eh, Compton has the stigma. I don't know. But I was like, let's keep an open mind about this. This can give us an opportunity to get our foot in the game. And then once we build up that equity, we can either sell or lease and then cash out, refi, and then go buy where we want to be right. at. Gotcha. So you guys, obviously, went, he went very fast. When he went over interest rates rising, that means there's less competitors in the market. Mm-hmm. That means we're skiing to where the puck is, is that we're always buying, we're always looking. That you did, let me tell you some things you did, I think, Dietrich, that were very good. You kept looking. You stayed in the fight, and then you also take advice. I feel like I've been saying, buy Englewood, buy Englewood. I've been saying it for like 10 years, what everybody's doing. I'm like, now I'm like, buy anything. No, no, buy anything. <laughs> but, but now, but play, play your strengths. You know what I mean? Right. Like, okay, everybody says, well, Compton, but I, I just want to tell you something. Like, you're off of the one, you know, I've been, you, know you don't have to give it to your exact house, but you're off of, by there's a 110 freeway, there's a 105, mm-hmm. there's there's freeways around I you, won. there's a way that, so you're doing that because you, you understand that uh, before we go to Jen, is one of the things that we want to look at that, whenever I'm buying a home, one of the first things I'm doing is how am I going to rent this house right now or sell right. it for double the value? If I, if I invest one dollar, I expect to make back, I used to say three, now I'm kind of in the two range, but in doing it, so I expect to make that back, Right. you know, like in doing it. So uh, one of the things, Jen, I want to ask you now about a little bit about sacrifice you made when you bought your first property or when you bought your second property. Um, the second property that I purchased, I actually got one that was a rundown building, older building that needed a lot of love and it needed uh, <laughs> the community as a small boutique condominium association. There's 32 units in it. And just needed to get on the board and get everybody together and start pulling the property up. Gotcha. So it's in a great location. It's just an old building. Gotcha. But you see you see what um, what she what she just said and then that's the lessons we always want to cover at the table and everything is this. So she bought a building and then you guys I and Jennifer, it's okay to say it. I always say buy the ugliest house. I'm gonna go into that in a minute, but but in doing it. But so she she bought some of those run down, so then I'm gonna use the word undervalued, because it's the same thing you use when you're buying stock. So here's the value of the home. It's undervalued. Then they have a horrible HOA. Now you know what I mean? Like so now we're looking at this. Look at all the properties that have horrible HOAs and different things. Then what did she do? She joined the HOA. Then she, well, then she's going to tell you later on how she became president of the HOA. And then she how she fixed everything up. Then people sent in proposals. They sent in pieces of paper to her that said it was hundreds of thousands of dollars. And she said, you know what? Then she called other people and found out how to get it much cheaper, got it fixed, and then what to do? It raised the value. So she's starting to move towards that. Two dollars. So you start to move to get things going and doing that. So here, let me ask you a question. What advice would you give to someone if they're starting out and they're saying they either don't own a home, and then since she already said she owned her second property, you know, because this family. Then I'm gonna let. Then I'm gonna let you guys ask me a question of, of a question if you guys want to, and I'll give give her the option and two about investing. But what advice would you give to someone if they're starting off right now and then, and then before Deidre, he's going to give these complicated answers, before Deidre knows this, is, <laughs> we have an inflationary environment. So he's, he, he's all these financial stuff. We live, in a, we live in a higher interest rate and there's also wars and rumors of wars going around. What advice would you give to somebody that was like, that was starting out uh, looking for their first property and then I'm going to go back to their, getting their second property? Yeah, I, I would say it really does come down to the numbers. Um, and this is something that I didn't know even in my second go of buying a home, right? right 2017, 2020. When you look at, say, like a Redfin or, you know, the, the real estate sites and you see the home that you're looking at and it says the price, that price on the home, $500,000 or whatever the price, that's not all that you have to come up with, right? That price <laughs> plus the closing costs. And I remember even in this last go around, you know, I knew that there was, you know, 
you know, they were like, okay, and just budget around like six or so percent of the closing costs. It was just random. And I'm such a precise person. I wanted to know, no, what is it? Because yes. I didn't know that I have it in the bank. Right. I need to know the money. And so I just said, you know what? Whenever I find the house I'm going to put an offer in, so that I, I don't ever want to be at that last day of escrow and find out I can't, I don't have the money to close and I default and I lose the deposit and all the things. Yeah. I want to have just, I just want to have 15%, 10 to 15% in the bank so I can cover whatever closing costs and then all the repairs and extra stuff on top of it. I don't want to just be financially free when it comes to the house. So that's the advice I would give. Right. When know you make your, your budget, know your numbers, the cost of the home, that includes like the down payment you need to have and also your closing costs. And then you're going to have, you know, your inspections costs. So guess what? When you buy a home and now you're in that 30 day or whatever your escrow window is and you got to say, is this foundation good? Are there termites in this house? How's this roof? You got to pay people to come to that house and look. So depending on how many inspections you get. And by the way, uh, in my price range, that meant homes that were 80 to 100 years old. Yeah. So that meant I, I got like four or so inspections. That was maybe 1,500 out the gate before I even owned the house. Right. right. So it's just you're putting money out before you own a home. So it really is make a budget and save. Right. It's savings, it's credit, and it's time. <clears throat> right. So I'm going to go back to that, but I got a few things. But back to that inspection thing is when we do inspections, they're like, what, four to $600, right? Depending, they're $400 for the home, then if you guys, if you buy units, they're 600, maybe 800, different things like that. That is not an expense, that is an investment. I use the appraisal, I use, not the appraisal, the inspection as my negotiating tool. Exactly. I'm like, this roof is already here, listen, I need to take yeah. off, and then I use yeah. an ungodly number, and then yeah. they'll tell me, Tori, we can't send them to take off $50,000, this already, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? I said, but just send it over. You know, that's yeah. your tool to learn yeah. how, that's how you find out. That's like going to the doctor and getting a checkup. Mm -hmm. But then also the other point you said was know your numbers and everything like that. Yeah. That is very, very important, okay? Deidre? So I would say for anybody who's out there looking to purchase that first home is the biggest thing that I can tell you, and this is coming from me as a real estate agent, is yeah. just don't give up. Right. The process may take a little bit longer than most people you know, think yeah. because they hear the stories, well, I close in 30 days, I close in 45 yeah. days. That's the closing. That's not the time it took them to actually find the house and go through you know, getting their credit ready and saving up money. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where a lot of people get discouraged at because that's a lot of what I see from my clientele mm -hmm. is they get discouraged mm -hmm. when they see prices going up and interest rates going up and they figure it, it's totally taking me out the market. Right. But don't give up and just stay having an open mind because you may not get into the area that, <clears throat> that you want to get into at first, but as long as you can get your foot into the game, that creates leverage. So now you have opportunities down the line when your property appreciates mm -hmm. to go into those areas that you desire. And you may never, you, I mean, you might find out a place that you didn't desire. When you get there, you absolutely love it. So I would say just keep an open mind. The biggest thing that I tell my clients all the time, fall in love with the neighborhood, not necessarily the house. Um, you can change the house over time. You cannot change the neighborhood. So, I, you know, as an agent, I can't physically pick that house up and put it in a great neighborhood. But you can take a trashy house in a really good neighborhood, force the equity in it by fixing it up. And now you've mm -hmm. increased your wealth right. by, you know, exponentially at that point. But what about doing that as far as uh, doing that with, uh, with going there with your wife? Oh, my and, gosh. And um, mortgages and it, things like no, this. that. No, this is where it really got interesting at because, you know, she's walking into it like, you know, we can fix the house up and do all this stuff. And I'm coming from the analytical standpoint of, okay, know the numbers. How much is it going to cost to fix this stuff up? Because what you're looking at right now is purely aesthetic stuff. What I'm thinking about is what does the foundation look like? What does the roof look like? What does the plumbing look like in the house? Is the electrical up to date? Those are going to be the big ticket items. Because once you get the house spruced up and it looks all great, if you don't have the electricity or the plumbing to serve that house properly, now you have additional problems. That money just went down the drain. So now you're, what you invested has not become an investment. It's become a money pit. Mm -hmm. And so those were things that I had to kind of walk her through. Like, when you see this, I see that. 
Right. And so it, it took a little bit of time for us to get kind of on the same page just in terms of what we're looking at and how much it was going to cost because I'm, I'm an analytic. So I'm running the numbers and I'm looking at, okay, fixing it up. But then the major repairs, what's it going to cost? And so I would go back and say, here's what I estimated it would cost us to do. And then she'd come back and go like, yeah, I don't, I don't want to do that. So it took a little bit of time for us to get on the same page, but I think it's because of what I do as a profession, she trusted me a little bit more in terms of like, okay, I'm gonna trust you know what you're doing because I've seen you do it before, so I'll take your advice and, and we'll do it this way. Jennifer, whenever I, I call, I'd be like, hey, Jen, man, hey, what you doing? It's like, ah, oh, man, I'm doing something. <laughs> Just, just give us a small glimpse of some. I, I, I'm rubbing my hands while she's talking. Go, tell us a small glimpse of some of the stuff you do when you renovate your place. How much you contract? How you work with the contract? How much you do yourself? Or to walk us through the last one, and then, uh, and then let me chime in during the when you started painting part and doesn't pay nobody because I need you to do that for me. But anyway, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, basically, in a nutshell, whatever I could do, like you guys, I just tried to do it. Yeah. And I would Google it, YouTube it. My walls, the place I moved into, the walls were just looking really rough. And I thought, I'd love it if these walls were sanded. I'd love it if it just, because if I'm gonna move in here, I gotta put everything into it. I can't go back later after your furniture's in there and everything else. So I thought, so I went through and I actually sanded the walls and uh, primed the walls and um, anyway, changed toilet flappers, like stuff I would have never thought I would ever done before. Um, in a nutshell. But that's one of the keys that you have to look at is decide what you're gonna do mm -hmm. and you stick to that and then you hire out everything else, but get the right people. Because yeah. if they know what they're doing, they should be able to do it quicker and in those areas. And then if mm -hmm. you get good, and then this is also another thing is, what I found out through time is when you find a really good person, ask them who can do the yeah. other things. Yeah. So like if you're saying, if you're here laying the floors and saying, hey man, do you do the ceiling such and such yeah. or doing that? And then that area, and then do this. And then how you really end up good is, back to the A, B, C, D. The couple of areas that you can do, if you can get everybody to work together and finish and then get all of your things, that's actually how you do it. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, any other things? That, so we want to make sure, if you guys have anything else, Jen, that you would make sure that if you wish you would have known earlier that you knew now that you'd like to share to help people that are getting their second home or uh, their first. I would just echo what we've already said is just don't give up. Many people think they can't do it and they can't have a home. Yes, you can have a home. You just have to maybe give up something or figure out how you can get it. But yes, you can have a home. Everybody can have a home. But you have to believe that and stay on it. Right. Anything else? I would say something that Jen touched on earlier. For those of people who are looking to move into communities that have an HOA, I tell my clients, get on the board. If anything, at least attend the board meetings. Mm -hmm. Because what you don't want to have happen is you just kind of let it go and all of a sudden you get a notice in the mail saying, hey, there's a $10,000 assessment because right. we need new plumbing or a new roof. Mm -hmm. And you go, well, I didn't vote on that. Well, guess who did vote on it? Right. The, people the that board showed up. and people that showed up. <laughs> right. You didn't have a voice because you didn't come. So it can be time consuming. I know it. But what would you rather have? A couple of hours every month or a $10,000 bill? that right. you have to pay out over the course of five years. Mm -hmm. right. So get on the board if you're doing an HOA community. Um, bare minimum, just attend the meetings. Yep. Right. Pretty and uh, she learned that too. And then also if the board, if everybody becomes active, there's a lot less work everybody has to do. Exactly. 10 people, 10 hours, then 30 people, as she said, that's like one hour, and then doing it and, and getting advocates and working together. And you've advocated for properties. Yeah. Anything else that you would want to share with yeah. someone that you wish you'd like to share with them that you know now that you wish you had known earlier? I would say make the list of, it, I think, and I fell into this as well, like, I want, I, want, I want a house. And I even told you, but I don't think I can do it. You said, just try. Okay. It was literally October of 2020. I was like, I'm just going to rent a place that has a backyard, because that's really what I want. I don't think I can buy. And then look at me now I'm in my house. Right. But I would say what would be really important is make a list of what you want and the why. Because I think when it gets hard, when you feel like you can't do it, coming back to that, mm -hmm. it becomes that fuel to keep it going. I just, it was a pandemic. I had an apartment, no patio. Right. I had no outdoor space. And I just kept saying, I just want to be in a garden and be able to be outside. And when my escrow went from 21 days to 100, when I got out being on eight properties all by right. cash offers, all, all these things, I was like, forget it. I just was like, I want to be outside in the garden. 
you know, and, and that actually helped fuel to get mm -hmm. through, honestly. So yeah. that was the thing I wish I would have known, you know, one, that just something just to focus on mm -hmm. and not not uh, to get caught up in the 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 hard the hard stuff because it is it isn't easy but you know nothing worth having comes easy exactly. right all the time right right so and that's what I wish choice. I knew it wasn't easy because sometimes you hear people I got my house and you just it just seems like it's supposed right. to be yeah, easy like, yeah, right easy. and I wish somebody would tell me easy that. and then all the thirty day escrows just so you know all that stuff thirty days and fifteen yes. days escrow the clothes, yeah. those are ads those yeah. aren't actual people no. yeah. that are doing it so, so this is the yeah. thing I wish what I'm saying when you say what do you wish you would know that it does take time. That, uh, you know, it can happen, it will happen, and just focus on what you want. Right. And really just remember that this is what you're working towards. That's an important point about the why and everything like that. What's wise? Family, I want to thank you for joining us at Wealth Cycle. A couple things. First is that, number one, there's, there's two clubs out there. One is called the Starters Club. Everybody's in that. I want to go to college. I want to graduate. I want to be married. I want to own a home. And then there's another club. It's called the Finishers Club. That's the people that finish at the end. So we want you to be in the Finishers Club. That's by setting goals, look, looking at all this great information that was shared today and that you can finish. It has been an honor to watch you guys go through the home buying process that I've watched. And it's like God has you on a channel and you're sitting on that channel and then you're in your apartment it's hot. It's pandemic. You got to go somewhere to get a mask and different things. And when you move into a house, God is changing your channel. Now your channel's in high definition. Amen. She wanted to get a condo. Now she has a yard and go out there and <laughs> smell the flowers. It's because she went through the process and finished it. I want you guys to continue to do what you're doing, but I also want you to get in the process. Ready, set, grow. There you have it, tons of great information. I hope you were able to take notes. If you weren't, go back and watch the episode again. And if it's something that you like, subscribe to the channel and share this information with somebody else. I upload new videos like this every week on YouTube. Now, part of what we talked about in that discussion was coming up with the money to actually purchase a house. And if you find yourself in that situation of trying to figure out how I'm gonna come up with this money, then you probably wanna watch these videos right here.